The Battle of Lowestoft took place on 13 June 1665 during the Second Anglo-Dutch War. A fleet of more than a hundred ships of the United Provinces commanded by Lieutenant Admiral Jacob Van Was and Air Objum attacked an English fleet of equal size commanded by James. Duke of York 40 miles east of the port of Lowestoft in Suffolk, England. The Dutch were desperate to prevent a second English blockade of their ports after the first was broken off by the English for lack of supplies. The leading Dutch politician, Johan de Witt, ordered Van Wassenaer to attack the English aggressively during a period of stable eastern winds which would have given the Dutch the weather gauge. Van Wassenaer however, perhaps feeling that his fleet was still too inferior in training and firepower to really challenge the English in full battle, postponed the fight till the wind turned in order to seek a minor confrontation in a defensive leeward position from which he could disengage quickly, and return without openly disobeying orders. His attitude would cost him a sixth of his fleet and his life. On the 11th of June Van Wassenaer sighted the English fleet of 109 ships carrying 4,542 guns and 22,055 men. It consisted of three squadrons. James himself commanded the van, the squadron of the Red Flag. Prince Rupert of the Rhine commanded the centre, the squadron of the White Flag and Edward Montagu, 1st Earl of Sandwich commanded the rearguard, the squadron of the Blue Flag. The Dutch fleet of 103 ships carrying 4,869 guns and 21,613 men had no less than seven squadrons, the first commanded by Van Wassenaer himself in Eendracht. The second commanded by Lieutenant Admiral Johan Evertsen on Hoth van Zeeland. The third commanded by Lieutenant Admiral Egbert Bartholomew Kortenaer on Groot Hollandia. The fourth commanded by Lieutenant Admiral Key Stellingworth on Seven Werolden. The fifth commanded by Vice Admiral Cornelis Tromp on Liefde. The sixth commanded by Vice Admiral Cornelis Evertsen the Elder on Vlissingenen. The seventh commanded by Vice Admiral Volkert Schramm on Wappen van Nassau. The reason for the large number of squadrons was that the smaller Dutch admiralties, and the many new flag officers recently appointed by them, insisted on having their own squadron. The admiralties of Amsterdam and the Maas then split their fleets to make squadrons of equal size to those of the smaller fleets. Both national fleets could only be so large by employing armed merchants. The English used 24 of these, the Dutch 12, some of them enormous Dutch East India Company warships, specially brought over from the Indies. The Dutch also had activated 18 laid-up warships from the previous war. On the 11th of June there was a calm and no battle could take place. On the 12th of June the wind again started to blow, and from the east, giving Van Wassenaer the weather gauge. However, he simply didn't attack, despite clear orders to do so under these conditions. Next morning the wind had turned to the west and now he approached the enemy fleet. The Battle Sea Battle of Lowestoft Ship List for all the Dutch and English ships involved in the battle It is difficult to give a strictly coherent account of the battle. Whilst there is a wealth of historical sources, these have never been properly studied. The English found the behaviour of Foggy Opdam puzzling and ascribed all kinds of intentions to him that, in reality, he never had. After the defeat the surviving Dutch flag officers, in order to exonerate themselves, pretended their fleet had followed the original written orders, blaming misfortune and cowardice among the merchant captains for the disaster. In the early morning of the 13th the Dutch fleet was positioned to the southeast of the English fleet. Most English historians have assumed Van Wassenaer made a sudden dash to the west, trying to regain the weather gauge, and the English beat him to it. If so, the wind must have been blowing from the southwest, otherwise there was no gain in this manoeuvre, but this makes it difficult to explain how the English fleet Sailing to the south could be swifter than the Dutch. An alternative interpretation, more in accordance with the Dutch sources, 
would be that the wind was blowing from the northwest and Van Wassenaer tried to engage the English from a defensive leeward position, his favorite tactic. Indeed, both fleets passed in opposite tack and then turned. During the turn the Great Charity became isolated and was boarded and captured by Captain Yan de Han, the later admiral, who immediately returned with his prize to the Netherlands, an obviously unsound practice that would be forbidden after this battle. Later an English victory tune, the Dutch Armado a mere bravado, declared. Fortune was pleasant when she lent the Dutch a charity, a thing they wanted much. After this there was a second pass. Though the English had some trouble controlling these maneuvers, the Dutch now completely failed to maintain a line of battle. In theory their being in a leeward position would have given the guns a superior range, allowing them to destroy from a safe distance the rigging of the English ships with chain shot. In reality the several squadrons began to block each other's line of sight. Those flag officers and captains most hungry for battle left the less enthusiastic and older ships quickly behind, while company ships, never trained in these tactics, behaved as if no other vessels were present and this disorder caused a part of the English line to shift over some heavier Dutch ships who only just managed to escape to their main force. Later they would claim they had intentionally tried to directly attack the enemy in accordance with general orders. Some other ships happened to be in an optimal range for the English to concentrate their fire and took heavy damage. The young life of the commander of the Frisian fleet, Lieutenant Admiral Kistellingworth, was ended when he was shot in two. Veteran Lieutenant Admiral Courtenay, probably the most competent Dutch commander present, was fatally wounded in the hip by a cannonball. Quartermaster Eitstenstra took command of Courtenay's ship. Van Wassenaer now suspended the squadron command structure, hoping by placing all ships directly under his own guidance to bring some coherence to the Dutch force. This only added to the confusion however, again both fleets turned, and now something strange happened that has proven very difficult to explain. After the maneuver the English rear should obviously have been to the north of the centre. All sources agree however that it resulted in a reversed order of the English fleet in that the rear guard was now to the south of the centre. The traditional English solution to this riddle has been that their fleets act synchronously, i.e., each individual ship turned simultaneously to reverse fleet order, instead of turning one behind the other. If true that would have been a truly unique accomplishment for that age. Dutch sources suggest a different explanation. While executing the third turn the Dutch fleet lost all coherence because the wind suddenly turned to the southwest. It then slammed into the English van and centre. The English rear, avoiding the mass of confused ships, sailed behind the Dutch fleet to the south. A flotilla from the van then closed the trap completely, blocking the intended return to the Dutch coast. This scenario explains why all maneuvering stopped and why some English flotillas clearly report trying to sail to the west, which would be inexplicable if they hadn't been to the east of the Dutch fleet. If indeed surrounded the Dutch would have been in a hopeless position. The English main force to the west of them would have had the weather gauge precluding boarding as a viable tactic. The English rear, firing from a leeward position, could have damaged the Dutch with impunity. As the Dutch had again the weather gauge in relation to the English rear, some of their ships wore to the east to attack it. Through such an action Montague's flagship was boarded and temporarily taken over by the crew of Orange commanded by Captain Bastian Santin, who even raised the Dutch flag on the Prince Royal until Rupert himself in the Royal James came to the rescue retaking the ship. At that point, the entire battle seems to have degenerated into a gigantic shapeless melee. During these fights the Earl of Marlborough and the Earl of Portland perished. A few hours later around noon Montague raised the blue squadron flag on his mizen topmast, a sign for my squadron to follow, and indeed most. Captains of the English rear followed their leader when he went straight for the Dutch line, and broke through it effectively dividing the Dutch fleet and surrounding part of it. 
Apart from these positional problems the Dutch had a structural disadvantage. On average their guns were much lighter. Especially the eight largest English vessels were almost unsinkable themselves but could wreck the smallest Dutch ships with a single broadside. The larger Dutch vessels therefore tried to protect the little ones. The Dutch flagship Eendracht dueled the Royal Charles. James was nearly killed by a Dutch chain shot decapitating several of his courtiers, the Hahn, Richard Boyle, the Viscount Muscari and the Earl of Falmouth who was not very highly thought of, prompting the poet of state affairs to later declare his shattered head the fearless Duke disdains and gave the last first proof that he had brains. Around three in the afternoon the duel between the Royal Charles and the Eendrat ended abruptly when the Eendrat exploded, killing Van Optum and all but five of the crew. Quartenaire was second in command, though fatally wounded he hadn't died yet and the other admirals were unaware of his condition. For hours the Dutch fleet was therefore without effective command. After the Eendrat had exploded, the English immediately became more aggressive, while many Dutch captains faltered. Some Dutch ships already fled a little later, followed by Cortenaire's ship the Groot Hollandia now commanded by Stinstra. Needless to say all of this had a rather negative effect on Dutch morale. By evening most of the Dutch fleet was in full flight, save for 40 ships or so under Vice Admiral Cornelis Tromp and Lieutenant Admiral Johan Evertsen, both having assumed command who made possible an escape and covered the flight, thus preventing complete catastrophe, though 16 more ships were lost. The English lost only one ship, the captured great charity mentioned above. Eight Dutch ships were sunk by the English, six of these were burnt in two separate incidents when they got entangled while fleeing and set ablaze by a fire ship. This happened to the Turgos entangling with the company ship the Mars Evian and the merchantman the Swannenberg, and also to the Co of Orden, the Stad Utrecht and the Prince Moritz. The earlier mentioned company ship the Orange exploded after being set on fire by another fire ship following many an attempt to block. Borden entered the Charles, in which she was prevented first by the Mary under Captain Jeremiah Smith, one of York's seconds, and later by the Royal Oak, the Essex and the Royal Catherine. According to some the Orange lost half of its crew of 400 before succumbing. A severely wounded Senton was picked up by an English vessel and shortly after succumbed himself. During the Dutch flight the English captured nine more ships. Hilversum, Delft, Zeelandia, Wappen van Edem and Jong Prins, the VOC ship Nagel Boom and the merchants Carolus Quintus, Mars and Gael de Schreuter. Trump was captured but escaped. Eight older ships had to be written off later, as the costs of repair would have exceeded their value. The English had lost one flag officer, Rear Admiral Robert Sampson, while Vice Admiral Lawson was mortally wounded. Notable English captains present at the battle included Captain of the Fleet William Penn in the Royal Charles. Ex-Buccaneer Christopher Mimes and George Askew. It has always been a mystery why the English fleet didn't at least try to pursue the Dutch. Several anecdotes are told to explain this. According to one pen remark to James that he was looking forward to the heavy fighting the next day, since he believed the Dutch were at their best when cornered, James, having narrowly escaped death already, then would have lost his nerve completely. Another legend has it that James's wife ordered Lord Henry Brunker to keep her husband safe. He obeyed by giving flag captain John Harmon the false order to stop the Charles in the night. In any case the Royal Charles reduced sail in the course of the evening and the rest of the English fleet followed suit. The outcome of the battle was partially caused by an inequality in firepower, but the Dutch had already embarked on an ambitious expansion program, building many heavier ships. The English failed to take advantage of their victory. They never managed an effective blockade of the Dutch coast and couldn't prevent the VOC fleet from returning from the Indies. The fleets, now much more equal in quality, met again at the Four Days Battle in June 1666.